Well, hello, creatives, community, and kind folks. Welcome to RPG with DBJ. I am your host, DBJ, and today in this part of the interwebs where we talk about science fiction, tabletop role-playing games, we're going to talk about faster than light travel, warp drives, wormholes, and that kind of thing. Um, maybe you are creating or designing your own world, or maybe you are um, uh, debating the merits of what kind of travel between the stars and or planets in your system. And we're going to talk about, you know, the the foibles of such and spoiler alert some of the best ways we can describe a lot of the technology in our worlds is actually describing what it can't do rather than what it is capable of so we're going to get into it um uh discuss the the differences between different types of um high range space travel of course all of this is uh fantastical and theoretical and uh what kind of stories we can tell with the limitations we place on said types of uh, interstellar um, and intergalactic space travel. So one of the first things that happens uh, with uh, that when we talk about space travel, yeah, <laughs> hey, what's going on there, there, uh, Shice, and everyone else who's able to partake in the show. So what do we mean, of course, by faster than light travel? Well, do we mean that our vehicles or ways we can travel between the stars um, literally happens at physically moving faster than the speed of light? Or are we folding space and stepping through uh, dimensional portals like flowing through a wormhole? And are we finding these locations in a natural sense that we are discovering where a wormhole is and if it is stable? Uh, or if not, as has been described in some science fiction, or are we creating those various portals, much like a um, a Stargate and such? And is a Stargate small enough that you could have one in the privacy of your own home? Or are these large, uh, large systems that are created, you know, big hoops that um, dreadnought-sized ships can flow through to get to another place? And we're going to talk about some of the, the fun things we can have with all of those. So... Yeah, as described sometimes, and, and I saw this as a Reddit uh, discussion about spacecraft folding space, moving at high speeds. And we've seen this plenty of times. Star Trek and Star Wars do a very similar thing where our spacecraft seemingly seem to stand still or they're just moving at very slow speeds. Um intergalactically speaking, and then suddenly they they hyper accelerate. And then on the tail end of the acceleration, they immediately slow down. And one someone's question was, well, couldn't they activate the hyperdrive and then just drift at high speed without having to run their engines, let's say? as if the vehicles are literally moving at high speed. And the response was, well, they need to keep the folded space system going. They have to burn energy because when it shuts off, they go back into a uh, normal limited space and they slow down. And so then it makes you think, well, okay, are they, are they physically traveling this way? Or are they folding space? Or are they passing through debris? And so these questions come up and mind you, uh, even having the question in the first place is actually kind of cool because then we can decide like, are our starships literally passing through solid objects or are they flowing into another extra dimensional space that pulls them out of our reality to enter here? Or is it just a constant acceleration, deceleration? Um, unlike say Star Wars or Star Trek, maybe this is a uh, physical space like uh, the expanse literally accelerating under 1G and doing a flip and burn and then doing it the other way. Yeah, it's just, it's, it does mention that Obsidian is realistic hard sci-fi. Lightspeed travel is impossible. Wormholes are made up. The only way is to, to spend years in space until your muscles hatch feet and you got cancer from cosmic rays. Uh, yeah, it's a real thing. <laughs> Obsidian start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a real thing to have to deal with. That, that, yeah, you could be a badass, like, I don't know, um, 
you know, x-ray laser gun toting, you know, soldier. And you're like, yeah. And all of a sudden at the end of the fight, you're like, oh, my bio, bio monitor says my my uh, heart muscle has atrophied. I've got, uh, you know, lethal doses of cosmic rays. And, oh, I'm also suffering from uh, isolation syndrome. So, yeah, <laughs> so th those are those are real things uh, when you're you talking about hard sci-fi. But um, there, while we understand that physics says that we cannot travel, the, the closer we get to um, the speed of light, even a percentage of the speed of light, the, the less um, our reality will exist around us. That that physically, the the amount of energy it would take to push a solid object up to that speed and our human perception of that uh, through physics as we know it today seems a bit a bit daunting that we may not really be able to reach it and so traveling just from our solar system to the next closest solar system would need like arc ships where we where there may even be a whole communities that will live and die on the ship just on the travel to get there and of course there's different methods of uh, people being asleep or awake? Um, are we going to change ourselves to become interstellar travels? Like, will we become digital information rather than biological bodies and that sort of thing? And so that brings up other, I mean, we'll talk about those things in, uh, in, in future supplements of this show, but but we're, we're here to talk about the space travel itself. So um, as always, there is a D12 list listed below for some using one or more of these limitations for your own various high speed travels, whether it's faster than light or not. And um, so we'll get into it. So uh, one of the things that we see in science fiction is the the idea of the spin up and the cool down. So maybe these, these high speed engines are, um, they, the proverbial, you need to get them, prepare them to be used, or they heat up so much, or there's some kind of energy transfer that they have to cool down on the end of it. So the spin up and cool down idea is that the the our main characters, the stars of our show, might be traveling with a group, or they may have their own starship, and they can't just press a button and just go, hey, hyperdrive, and they're gone. It's like there might be a spin up and this spin up might take minutes, hours, heck, even days to achieve the the matrices, the the, the power levels. Um, maybe it's a very um, intensive technique to get these engines to spin up to the point where it can allow them to travel at high, very high speeds, uh, much, much like the physical idea of of constant acceleration well you got to start from zero and that constant acceleration just builds on the acceleration um as it moves on much like a like a magnetic accelerator but yeah it could be now shai says six thousand years with currently foreseeable technology to make it to our nearest neighbor yeah proxima centauri b only 4.24 light years away yeah use the word only it makes things a uh, smaller simpler to <laughs> yeah. You ever you ever hear somebody tell you something like, oh, it only costs and they fill in the blank and you're just you're just rolling your eyes like, yeah, for you, it only costs that much money. But for the rest of us regular folks. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Mm -mm -mm. But yeah, there. I mean, now, does it mean that we won't use arc ships, um, seed ships? I don't know what's another name for for them. Uh, arc seat, um, basically moving continent style or size spacecraft where we we travel with our family and friends and things like that and just travel. Maybe, maybe. I, I mean, I can see while it wouldn't be popular, I can see some people who would volunteer to go on these 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 colony ships thank you very much there yeah colony ships and i and i wonder if there would be enough people to volunteer knowing that they wouldn't reach the tail end of um 
of arrival because that's the real big thing right like even today we talk about going to mars and i mean we we talk about mars exploration and despite the fact that it's probably <laughs> yeah time to talk about <laughs> space dust again yeah i mean while while there's a good chance <clears throat> that as we get more technology visiting other planets even in our own solar system is going to be automated there's still something in us that wants to say, like, I want to step foot on this other place. Like, I want to physically be there, even if the technology makes it so that we really don't even need to do that. You know? But, okay. Another one is talking about the space dust again. Another one is just simple nav calculation. Now, it, it does seem a little bit strange sometimes when it comes to uh, our sci-fi depiction of hyperspace travel, because they will say, like, well, we... We need to use the nav calculator to to pinpoint where we're going to go, and and then they go in a seemingly go in a straight line, right? And we know that space isn't. It's both extremely empty and then filled with a lot of things, such as space dust and debris and micrometeors and um, gravity that happens when you travel between different types of gravity wells and such. And so there's this, you know, one of the limitations on faster than like travel and science fiction has always been like the nav calculation. And again, much like the spin up and cool down, your your players may not be able to easily and immediately press a button and press go. Right. It's not flip up the plastic hatch and press the button and then you, you shoot off. It could be that, hey, without the nav calculator, you're going to run into a lot of things. Uh, side note. And this is an image. Um, let me see if I can find. Um, let's see. Guild Navigators Dune Movie. And um, sorry, because I, 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 there's an image I want to bring up here. And that is that the. Um, uh, oh, it's not showing me. I, it's showing me the Guild Navigators, but I want to see in the first Dune movie, they don't even explain to us how. They do the folding space, but they show us, they give us an image of the spacecraft in orbit. And if you look at it very, very closely, you'll notice that um, you'll notice that the I don't know what you would call this. Uh, let's see if we can. There's got to be an image here. I know there's an image. There we go. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, there it is. Ba, 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 ba. So, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So there's different different methods when we talk about like um, uh, how folding space and how to navigate through space. And originally in Dune, the reason why they would, their, the guild navigators had and used spice was so that they could predict not running into space debris. And so it was a psychic uh, predictive drug that allowed the pilots to avoid running into space dust. As the mo This was from the writer, Frank Herbert. But in the movie, when they talked about folding space and navigating space, the guild navigators actually folded space to go from one to another and this is not explained in the movie but with this image off to the the left but the very right of the thing that i'm sharing if you see the first dune movie this big cylindrical here here's one image of it it looks like a cigar of some sort and some say it actually has a little bit of a worm look to it where the inside of it is these massive ships and they're hollow or seemingly hollow down the middle and when you look into the image from the first Dune movie, you'll notice that there's a blue planet on one end that does not align with the background. And you get the idea that these very large ships are able to, it's basically a, um, a technological wormhole. You go from one star system and you are allowed to pass through the giant, massive guild navigated ship to come to another place. So they make these uh, portals, these uh, wormholes. Um, 
and let's there's another image maybe more clear without a circle in this and uh ah you can't see that one let's see if there's another image here mm -mm -mm. Yeah, it's a little better you can you can see the curvature of a blue planet and then that this large ship and then this smaller one and D uh, Denis Villeneuve the, the the director of the movie has an excellent eye for creating scale and then this smaller ship that looks very small like a like a pod is you know is like this massive starship that lands on on the planet uh, Arrakis so uh but very cool how they did that how they you, you know they they expressed a a wormhole technological wormhole so that's one method of of expressing how that is done so, eh, let's get this closest down here mm -mm -mm. or eh, let's shut this down mm -mm. yeah drew says true but the books never said how the space travel worked and i find the space folding idea good so do i so do i and even the writer who saw the move the the original um uh, not original uh 80s version of dune even was like oh i hadn't thought about space folding like that that's a good idea and then kind of accepted it like as a as an explanation so even the writer himself after writing the, the books really who didn't really describe it it was like oh that's a good vis visible representation yeah space folding wormholes are the new religion equally implausible as the old ones yeah yeah and it, you know how we it's always described as like well space folding is like a piece of paper and you fold it in half you stick a pencil through it and blah 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 right but um yep and like Drew says mathematically a wormhole would work but sure it's only theory exactly I exactly and you know it's it depends on in your own setting like is that the kind of thing that's accepted or whatever um so one one down in the the doobly do with the d12 list i did put down in um basically like doorways you know so as described in this um in, as described in this little dune feature here can we make technological doorways and if so that means that there's a there a storytelling idea may be that when we create a door on one end how how do we get the door on the other end? So, for example, it, is there one doorway that opens between two distant locations? Or do we need two doors, one door on one end, let's say it's on our moon, and then we have to physically travel to Proxima Centauri B to open up the other end of the door to activate it to then allow one person to travel in a spaceship or sealed suit or whatever and walk through from one place to another um you know are these is this stargating but you have to physically arrive at a place which might this actually might be a really good idea to to allow to to force players to physically have to arrive in a place do the complete exploration and set up a colony or whatever the case may be to then turn the door on and let the dignitaries just walk through and and like it's no big deal which is a bit of a your your work is necessary but also seemingly like a uh, tertiary after it's done like oh thanks for thanks for opening up the door we don't need you any longer but i think that would be a really cool idea to like now mind you these don't have to be literal doorways where they're human sized these may only be possible in orbit like Oh no! You, we've got to arrive at Proxima B, and then I don't know harness materials from you know local meteorites or a small moon to build this giant hoop that's a you know five kilometers you know in diameter to allow these other s starships to come through it, um, and you know power it up with the local sun or whatever, or um, we, we've got our, we have to turn on the, the fifth fusion reactor to get it done or something like that. So that's a possibility that like, it might be technological wormholes where we're creating our own, but you have to send a crew there first, which might be kind of cool. Or destroying a door on one end or the other could prevent those uses as possible. Now, um, 
another thing when it comes to to starship engines is uh the fragility or high maintenance of said things so that kind of runs with the the the, the spin up cooldown where where the engines work to allow faster than light travel or at least subliminal travel but maybe it's just very very fragile and high maintenance like once you use it maybe it, it's like it rattles itself to death <laughs> when you get to the other end it's constantly replacement parts and recalibrating the machine and th that sort of thing uh, you know needing to 3d print materials or find rare objects or materials or whatever and we're going to get to the fuel next part but maybe there's something on the other end that you need to acquire and having fragile engines may be that maybe they're not very good in battle or war warfare like sure it can be a troop transport or materials transport but launch one high velocity object at the, the starship and the engine just you know um like having one of those oh what's the thing there as a kid you used to have um races in the park where you'd have a plastic spoon and an uncracked egg on the spoon and you had to run a relay race without dropping the egg right and if you broke the egg you had to go get another egg and try to run the race again and so things like that and it may just be like yeah you don't want to put these engines on warships or at least maybe they're external so that the, the engines get the you know the, the large craft where it goes and then the engines are placed in like geosynchronous orbit or they're hidden on a moon or something like that because they're very fragile which would make uh destruction of them easy but theft and sabotage very simple to do which could also be a a, a storytelling tell element uh we also have um gravity well sensitivity and for me like gravity well sensitivity is like you're not able to use these sci-fi engines close to a very high gravity well which might mean that sure you could travel to proxima but you you can only begin and end at the edge of the solar system so for example in our own solar system maybe the closest you can get is like outside the oort cloud or in the kuiper belt out by uh pluto and sharon or karen or the boatman but you you get my point like may, maybe like jupiter and the, and our sun or these other other um large bodies that have a, a very high gravity to them maybe there's a limitation and it's like yeah you could get there close by but you can't you you can't pull up and park next to it much like um giant cargo ships and cruise ships cannot uh dock everywhere because of how deep they are into the ocean and you actually have to take uh, tenders, uh, small small craft to go from to an island so that they drop anchor and then you have to take a smaller ship and that may be the thing. So yeah, Scheiss is a hypothetical uh, structure connecting disparate points in space time based on a solution <laughs> of Einsteinian field operations. Yeah, or a Jewish carpenter, undead socialist savior, which flavor of copium do you prefer? Well, it depends. Jews like care is a boatman now. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for, for those who are, we don't know, which would be kind of, whoa, that, the whole, wow. They must have changed something. I was, I'm very surprised that the, your entire uh, thing came up. But yeah, there may be, how to explain, most science fiction completely ignores religion like it like either we've we've grown past it or um it doesn't have any bearing on the story or what have you but i wonder as we become as our perceptions grow that the the thing we know we don't know starts growing at such an exponential rate that many people in the scientific community start becoming religious because of the things that they see. And I wonder, uh, not, I'm, this is just a, a, a storytelling theoretical thing I'm thinking in my head. I wonder if like AI, like have we ever thought of AI becoming religious in some way, shape or form because of knowing how much they don't know about the physical world 
and uh, it's unexplained occurrences and things like that. I don't know. That'd be kind of cool. I mean, they they kind of hint to this in the movie The Creator. Uh, I just look. I do. I was just watching a video by um, Lindy Lindy Binge Lindy Binge. Uh, the you you know who the the the, the YouTube channel is. Anyway, was talking about how you had like um, in the Far East in the movie there were AI robots that were wearing saffron robes. They were monks, and it was like and the idea that like would AI become monk like. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Yeah, you have to have a coin in your mouth or else Karen will call the manager. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't cross over to the underworld. <laughs> yeah, and Drew says Battlestar Galactica had the Cylons also being religious as well. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, it it's it's a it's a part of like AI that we really don't talk about when we talk about um, AI being conscious and uh, human-like, and is it is it their brilliance that would scare us, or is it the um, how do I explain this? Is it the brilliance that would scare us, or is it their humanity that would scare us as something being artificial? I don't know. I didn't now see. I'm not familiar with the Overwatch games, although I know there was there's been some controversy with the Overwatch games, uh, a, a racial component to it that people lost their minds about um but the overwatch game also had monk like robots which is kind of cool i like that I, I like i like the concept of that and playing with that okay so um one um uh, another method to control very fast very easy um high speed travel intergalactically is basically um you know, high fuel consumption. And this this is a, we, we've seen this in Star Trek plenty of times where you, you, even though Star Wars never really dealt with it except for the solo movie. Um, oh, in, uh, in over, I believe it's Overwatch. Let's, if, let's go find it. Um, over, in over, Overwatch. Uh, It's component. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's either Overwatch or the or there's a similar game to it. Maybe uh, I can't remember. Um, you play a your character has a is randomly generated. So you're playing within the body of a character that was randomly generated, and some people had a. Um, a problem that they were playing a character that wasn't their own race and they didn't like it. Uh, and you would be assigned a random, like you would, when you create a character that you were assigned a random uh, race and gender. Yeah. And yep. It, uh, and doing a little bit of a search, there's some articles and things like that. People, um, and talk about ethnic groups in Overwatch and um, how, you know, blizzards went out of their way. Yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. So anyway, uh, but I remember at the time it was like some, some. I, it was a, you know how it is. People, the, 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 uh, the, the small minority are the loudest ones. Drew says, I know they changed the name of a character since that was originally named of an employee, which had been really sexist. I didn't realize that. I didn't know that. And and you know what? That happens a lot in, in uh, video games and things like that, like the behind the scenes. People will put someone's name in there or like, um, I don't know, they'll, they'll, they'll put Easter eggs. And some of those Easter eggs are people or places and things and, and things like that. And then you real, they don't realize like, oops. Amongst us as employees, it was funny, but when you put it out there, people were taking it the wrong way and stuff like that. Yeah, getting <laughs> slow clap <laughs> on that one. Yeah, getting randomly selected for what ethnicity you are. There's some other games like that. I think it's called Real Life. <laughs> that is true. 
that is that is very true, which is why, you know, um, racial disparity and, and people that, I don't know, waste time actually having a having a hatred for other groups um, is is pretty ridiculous because, you know, we didn't pick who we were. Right. We we pick who we who we are as maturity, but we don't we didn't pick being born. We just were. And then we we dealt with the we're dealt. We deal with the hand that we're given. Uh, it was pretty, pretty ridiculous. So um, Star Trek dilithium crystal thing, fuel, easy. It, it, that's an easy one, right? Like, hey, sure, you can fly from, from A to B, but it's going to cost you a lot of fuel. Now, in, uh, in Obsidian Star, uh, I use Overwatch is a hero shooter. There are clear characters. No random is there. Was that Starfield or what was the name of the one that had um, that had the mentioned issue. I, mm, I don't remember it. Sorry, I don't. But but I mean, just a, I, I did a search for um, Overwatch racial component. There's a bunch of articles that came up about it um, with different characters and and things of that nature. So I mean, it it wasn't something that was overlooked. So and I, I bet there were a number of games. I bet there were a number of games that, and there's like YouTube videos and things like that. Like there, here's one from 2016. Ugh, the amount of racist skins in this game is a little unsettling. Someone, someone right just came up or, and someone's put down like no African-Americans. And, and then somebody says, after three years, it makes no sense. There, there are no black characters or so. It's all kinds of different things like that. So, so it came up. And it comes up and it's one of the, you know, and then you get to the, the issue of like, you know, either you include no one or everyone. And then if you if you don't include some people and it, it's, it's, it just gets into a big fuzzy thing. So um, in in Obsidian Star, we do have uh, ice fire engines, which basically take water, the hydrogen and, and oxygen and use a method that I'm calling hyperelectrolysis which doesn't really exist, but it's a gimme. And it can basically take water and, and turn it into liquid hydrogen and oxygen, both of which are current day fuels for firing rockets. Now, chemical rockets just used in space would still be a bit impossible to travel from like Mars to Jupiter or something like that. So the added component to that is not only being able to take literally uh, ice and water and turning it into hydrogen and oxygen fuel, but using it through a magnetic bottle effect so that once it is ignited, it is compressed to the point that it allows constant acceleration. It's basically extruded through pinpoint extrusion. I, I don't know what the scientific firm, firm the scientific uh, description of this would be, but essentially it is how you achieve with a garden hose and you put your thumb over the garden hose or uh, the garden hose actuator when you spray water and you, you're you able to adjust the nozzle to get the most like a, um, what's the thing, uh, uh, a power sprayer that uses uh, pressure. It's the same thing. The fuel is ignited and then compressed down to such a pinpoint that it, it creates thrust. And that thrust allows starships, six shooters, to travel um, from one plant to another. The problem is that the fuel, you, you can't carry that much fuel. So it is a, a system where you may be able to travel from one planetary system, maybe to a second one, but you're probably gonna run out of fuel when you get there. So you're gonna have to either process ice or find a depot or steel or come across stored uh, liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Or you could just ramjet it and go um, scoop uh, like ethane and methane and um, uh, sulfur or other things out of like gas giants and um, get fuel that way as well, which takes a little bit longer. It's just easier just to find pods. So uh, in Obsidian Star, s s space travel is, uh, is fractual ownership, much like here in the States we have like I have a barbecue and that barbecue is fueled by propane with propane tanks. And I don't actually ever, people that have propane tanks don't actually ever own the tank. 
we you actually take the empty tank back it, and get a discount because you exchange one tank for another full tank and then i take the full tank back home and so uh, if if i want to buy one a tank without an exchange it costs more money because the tank costs money so your empty tanks are left behind you get new tanks and uh, or pods or whatever you want to call them and then attach them to your ship and then go flying off and you you can get credit for dropping off your empty tanks and stay within say saturn's the the saturn sphere and the moons and things like that and just travel around there but if you want to go from saturn back to mars you're going to need to fuel up and get some big fuel shy says do you really need that much fuel though because once you get going real fast, nothing in space is going to slow you down, assuming you dodge all the space debris. Well, that's if you want to go under constant acceleration. So you you are correct. So, for example, if you if you begin accelerating and then turn your engines off, you yourself will be floating in what would be equivalent of zero gravity. Right. But you're because you're not in a constant acceleration, but your craft will be moving at the same speed, whereas the 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 assumed method to get there fast is to burn fuel the entire time halfway there flip and burn and then and then slow yourself down to get one gravity so that's that's how that works um so yes you can can you save fuel and get there a little slower yeah and you'll do it with either very low gravity or none in your starship by just like burning a little bit adjusting your distance you know burn a little bit more stop you know that kind of thing yeah yeah hell yeah um or you could go faster too. You don't need to accelerate at one to, to keep one G. You could just you could go 1.5 or 2G if you want to and, and double your ability to get there. So yeah, both both are possible. Um, but you could could you burn through all your fuel? Exact. That's exactly how it works. That's anyway, that's the this is the limitation I've accepted into the game. That that yes, the engines are relatively uh efficient. Uh, you know, no, no, I, there's no chance, uh, th there's very low chances of your engine just exploding and killing you on a simple travel from one place to another. It's also storytelling wise, it's like, oh, random roll, this roll percentile dice, you're leaving Mars and all of you are dead, right? Like, that would be a little bit uh, for a role playing game. It's like, even though it may happen, it's like, eh, no, it's pretty efficient. It's probably as efficient as air travel is. it would be today because air travel has gotten uh, air travel accidents down to such a low percentage that it's it's it, it, it has such a low percentage of of accidents and they still happen that it's pretty daunting. But that's because humanity decided that that's the thing that we want to focus on. So. Drew says, interesting, a comment was eaten, and it only had me mention the body's moisture that we could take with GPJ as fuel. Uh, may, maybe that's a good thing, because I don't know how much. <laughs> Thanks, Drew, for sopping me up with an absorbent towelette. I appreciate that. Um, okay, uh, going back to Dune with the guild navigators, maybe in your travel, you have to have specialized pilots. and. Spe specialized pilots are a, a real a thing that's been used in science fiction oh, more than a little bit. Um, either your starship has like an AI or a human's brain. I don't know. Um, a living starship. I'm looking at you, Andromeda. I'm looking at you, uh, Farscape. You know, um, and, and we often have a holographic or android actor portray the starship that's able to, you know, travel from one place to another. Um, maybe the, 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 the pilots are psychic, like guild navigators using spice, as was kind of depicted in the first L David Lynch movie. They and so, so, so addicted to the spice that they turn kind of alien like or fetus like or something. It's very strange. Um, very strange uh, looks to them. Let's see if we can find some guild navigator. There we go. We got some guild navigator imagery here. I'm going to share out to you guys. Um, so yeah, maybe there's a, a specialized um, pilots that are used in your own particular games. I mean, uh, can you see this a little bit better here? And you know, um, are they? <laughs> are these? Uh, insectoid 
fetal like beings that that are like mutated uh are they genetically created um in the Denis Villeneuve movie we we are shown the guild navigators and they have these like gas filled helmets breathing in the very I will let's enhance this image here um uh, breathing in the gases, you can barely see their faces. They're wearing robes and that kind of thing. Um, may, maybe they are. Uh, there's a series of books by C.S. Friedman where neuro people who are neurodivergent are used as pilots because they can see into like a fourth dimensional space to allow intergalactic travel. And there's a corporation who is, dare I say, um psychologically torturing young people to become neurodivergent so that they can become pilots and one of our main characters has a number of personalities in her head which help her escape and it's a really cool because uh in in the story and I, I on alien on alien shores Shice says those guild navigators are actually mutated humans yes uh, from from what I understand, with within the Dune world, each of the houses kind of has humans, but they've 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 been separated and mutated themselves and, and genetically altered themselves. That like the Har the Harkonnen or the Harkonnen are air quotes human, but they don't look human any longer, kind of. And the Guild Navigators are the same way, from what I understand. And they, in order for them to do what they do to navigate, they need copious amounts of spice and the helmets at least from Denis Villeneuve's unexplained usage is that they breathe it in and it allows them to be uh, pilots but maybe in your world like maybe even today like you, you can't just jump into the pilot ship and just pilot these things maybe you need specialized skill which is a little bit more down to earth right like hey it's not just grabbing a yoke and flying it like an aircraft. You need to be able to read all of the instrumentation and uh, only a skilled individual could read that in instrumentation. Whereas, um, uh, let's see, something like, here's a uh, oh, fan art. No, no. Um, there's a larger image here where um, in the um, in the David Lynch movie, we, we have the navigators that are like, uh, tending or acolytes tending to the actual navigator which is like this um you know the wow my brain's not working um the worm like i don't know fetal like alien which is really just a human mutated and such so yeah um and, and you could do anything in between right like uh here's another image that someone created of guild navigators where you have a, a larger alien like guild navigator mutated human being inside the, the jar. And then you have the, uh, the, the, the valets, the, the caregivers, the acolytes that may advance to that with their own little helmets on breathing helmets and things like that. So, so yeah, yeah. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. I, I like the idea of that too. It's something different and heck why not? Why not be different? In our own thing now um another way of doing travel without the wormhole doorway uh thing where where we can i mean we can still focus on that is basically using beacons so um it instead of establishing a a and i should have mentioned this earlier so instead of establishing a um, stargate like a big giant circle and you put a ship through it and it comes out the other end it star travel may just be beacon like so in other words maybe an automated beacons can be sent out like drones or a starship can travel somewhere and drop a beacon somewhere or leave one in in orbit or whatever and it's the it's the beacons that make the map of allowing us to travel from place to place in relative safety so you know, it, a big part of science fiction are the um, the space lanes, the the highway of traveling from one place to another. But you know, sometimes that travel might have like like the micrometeors, the space dust, uh, the nebula, the 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 binary star systems, and things of that nature. If you want to go far past our own solar system, 
I personally, in my own um, setting, is limited to the Oort cloud and everything inside of it. It's both vast, but then like a bubble. And I, I like the idea of having a psychological imprisonment, even though it's, you know, it's our own solar system. But if you are one that wants to go to lots of places, maybe beacons are the way that it are the really only way that you can travel. That if you don't follow the beacons, which are the space lanes, then you're going to get into a lot. You're going to impact places. You may get lost, get pulled into gravity wells. Um, uh, you, you, you get pulled off the galactic elliptic or something. And that the beacons are like GPS systems to, to allow one to navigate. And the beacons may even get the starships to go around dangers. So it's basically like a stepping stones that beacons are like stepping stones so no you're not may not be traveling in a straight line but if you want to get there safely and efficiently you you could snake your way past nebula and dust and things like that and the beacons may move themselves so that it's not like they're placed in one spot and then they just never move it is the beacon system may be a local localized mapping of getting from a to b and it's all the well, it's instead of getting from A, or actually maybe more numerically, instead of getting from one to two, it's like 1.3, 1.7, 1.865, right? Like it's like little little jumps to move and blah, 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 just to get to another place. So yeah, so, and, and you, mind you, if you want to really make problems for your players to have to navigate is to stack some of these. So maybe they need specialized pilots they need fuel. They need to use the, the beacon system to get where, where to go. And those beacons might be monitored by different factions, which we're going to get into something else here, which is um, um uh, space travel may only be possible by faction, which is, again, we, we end up flowing back to the guild navigators, uh, which in their space travel galactic empire, they have stacked limitations as well. So you need spice, you need specialized pilots, and it's only controlled by a specific guild. So the, the the specialized piloting could be just individuals that are like, listen, I'm a good pilot. I'm just for hire. I'm hanging out in the in the cantina. No big deal. You need a pilot. I can get you there. Or um, when it comes to specific factions, factions could be government, uh, criminal organizations. Uh, those factions could be controlled by solar system so hey you want to get through here we need to board your ship to pilot you past this danger and you need you owe us something so it could be um like a tugboating of sorts and i kind of use that in my own uh inter solar cyst world where we have starships that are known as six shooters and basically they can get local starships let's say you're around saturn but you want to travel to Neptune and you don't have the fuel to do it, but you can get, um, you can be attached to a six shooter yourself and five other large craft will attach to the outside of a ship. And then that ship itself will take you to a place. And then everyone shares in uh, collectively in the travel, the fuel costs and the pilot that gets you there is the long range person that drops you off. And then now you can fly around in your, um, uh, proverbial um, impulse drive starship when you when you get to Neptune or something like that. So that's how it's used in mine, and it's it's fractal ownership. So the six shooters really can't afford to do it on their own, so they need other people to collect together, and then the others that want to collect together can't. They don't have the the infrastructure to get themselves from planet to planet. So it's it's kind of a uh, a conglomeration of all those things put together. Um, Lastly, it's the um, uh, it could be black box tech. So black box tech is basically everyone knows that the system works, but no one knows how it works. And for a while there, like, for example, uh, nuclear technology, atomic and nuclear technologies here today are kind of like that, where I'm not saying that there aren't brilliant people who understand what radiation is, but there were many people who were like, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't be and even today there are people who are like this is a dangerous fuel to use for energy maybe we should understand how its usefulness is completely including disposal rather than just jumping into it so 
uh, this space travel could be black box technology. Another way to think about it is uh, the idea of humans being given this technology from aliens. And while we are able to build or even rent to own um, starship engines, we may not know exactly how they work. So the, the folding of space, the extra dimensionality, the phase shifting to pass through solid objects, the, the, the finding of wormholes and all this other kind of stuff may be something that we really can't even repair. And we don't even know exactly how it works. We just know it does work, at least to get us from A to B. And uh, the side effects might be completely different, which brings me up to the last thing before we get out of here is um, uh, here there be dragons. So we've seen the old maps of uh, old earth <laughs> and whenever those maps were drawn out in the edges you see you know they always show like the sea serpents or the dragons and you know the big arrow like monsters here there be dragons and of course today we we know that maybe there were there were giant alligators and uh maybe prehistoric sized animals and whales and things like that like and and that's what they consider to be dragons but in in Going through space, well, maybe this is here, there be drags might be second to last that I might talk about, sorry, but there may be eldritch horrors that we don't know about the, the and out in space. Now, this is a little bit too sci-fi if, you, if you're a, a hard sci-fi tabletop gamer, but one thing could be that it maybe these aren't physical eldritch horrors. These could be psychological horrors that we perceive to be real. So um, maybe traveling at these hyper fast speeds or faster than light or folding space means that we see things, a reflection of our own subconscious or the, the subconscious nature of everyone else that's in this other extra dimensional space or whatever, what have you. Um, the, the idea that our sanity might be threatened could also be a part of why we believe these eldritch horrors are out there. We also don't know about the energies involved in going towards subliminal speeds and radiations and gravity and time that affect our bodies. So physical mutation may be a thing, or uh, uh, I don't know if there's, this is, this is really pulling at the sci-fi part, more the fantastical than the, than the, the theoretical, but the, the fantastical part may be picking up or being mutated into something that is alien that we weren't meant to grow into. So it may not just be cancers and broken DNA. Maybe our DNA mutates into something that we weren't meant to be, but we travel faster and farther and go places and we may become one of the tenants of a Obsidian Star that TTRPG and working on. One of those uh, tenants may be the idea that we become our own aliens. So the further we leave our, we, we leave Earth or Terra, the further we go out into our solar system and beyond, maybe the more alien we become until we really don't recognize ourselves as being uh, human or humanity. So that might be cool. Uh, lastly, might be the, the awakened sleep idea that in order to travel, it, it's not just hibernation and seed ships and colony ships that we need to use but maybe we actually need to be asleep before we do such a thing. And only certain, going back to the specialist piloting idea, that there's only certain people that can remain awake, such as uh, um, uh, Alien Shore, C.S. Friedman, Alien. Is it this Alien Shore? It's the name of the book. This Alien Shore, the out the Outworld series, that's what it's called. Um, mm, 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 mm. So we'll, we'll shave it. You, you can't really see much, but um, uh, it's, do they give away the plot? An explosion in her habitat sends young Jamesia Shido scrambling through the corridors in an escape capsule. Intercepted by an interstellar passenger ship, she sets out for the stars, pursued by inner demons as well as Terran and galactic pursuers. Demons hide in the depths of jump space as well, much as killer whales pursue seals diving from one ice flow to the next. Um, yeah, they in in this series, there's a uh, they're known as jump ships, 
and it's called This Alien Shore. I was like, Distant Alien Shores? No, it's, it's This Alien Shore. And, um, and you know, in, in this book series, the book takes place in the far future when interstellar flight has caused mutations in the human race. Some were minute differences, some to the point of grotesquerie. These mutations eventually led to the secession of interstellar flight, stranding a majority of the population away from their culture and supplies that were rooted on Earth. This causes worlds to reinvent themselves with some coming out, of, out stronger. Eventually, one planet discovers a method of interstellar travel that does not cause adverse effects. They create a company called the Outspace Guild. Due to the mutations, the guild is the only one that can use this method of travel, and it quickly becomes a monopoly. And we, we, we spoiler alert for a book that was produced in 99, 98. Um, yeah, the, the series is basically the corporation created their, their pilots uh, through pretty traumatic methods for our main character. So, uh, but that the idea was that the crew would have to fall asleep or be put in stasis because they could not handle the fourth dimensionality of traveling through jump space. And only ones who were of a particular neural divergence could comprehend the, the, the fourth axis of travel and such. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Instead of a colony ship, okay, an idea. Instead of a colony ship, the autopilot robot-controlled ship carries a whole bunch of human embryos and grows them in vitro upon arrival. Uh, the that's kind of like technological panspermia. I think it would be the would be a scientific thing, and I I think I'm actually correct in this. I'm going to pat myself, break my arm, pat myself on the back. Yes, uh, technological panspermia, basically taking genetic material to another place and growing those people. Uh, the same thing happened in Interstellar. If we if we realize that what the plot of Saving Humanity was, that in that movie, humanity was able to um, go to another star system and it's like taking embryos or 23andMe <laughs> kind of thing. You know, everybody's half a chromie and... Um, the people that arrive, maybe there's only a very few crew, no more than maybe 100, 150, just enough to create a, uh, a enough genetic divergency. And then with the, cr the crew there, without having to have a full government beyond like 100 people, 150 people, we also have uh, genetic material where they can grow children and create other people. So that would be kind of cool. Yep. Then it only needs to avoid space dust and cosmic rays for, for the 6,000 year trip to Proxima Centauri. That's something else that's going to, um, the, the role-playing game, the, the expanse by fantasy flight, or is it the age system? It's the age system. Sorry. Um, uh, the, 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 the expanse, they actually have distance travel between the planets, but my, my argument with that is, as the planets revolve, we are at our closest point from Earth to Mars, and then sometimes we are at our farthest point from Earth to Mars with the sun in between either of us. So can you really have a, a standardized amount of distance and speed? And they, I mean, it's a role-playing game, so you do have some standardization, but uh, I, I'm, tr I'm going to try to figure it out uh, using real science. Uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let a computer do it. I'm just going to Google it in and see if it comes out. But yeah, Drew says the film Nope has a great blend of psychological horror and cosmic horror. At least that is how I interpreted it. And listen, cosmic horror doesn't need to be, you know, Cthulhu. I don't know how to pronounce but the extra L's and H's in there. But, you know, no Yog Sothoth and whatnot. It doesn't need to be that. It could just be that our perception of it is like a cosmic horror. I mean, heck, I think... We as humans, if we go into orbit, just seeing Earth from that distance and knowing how small we are in the universe, for some people, is a cosmic horror, uh, ascension, um, eye-opening experience to many people. M much like those of us that stand at the precipice of, of human nature. When I went to, I went on a cruise to Alaska and I had that feeling. 
where, you know, I'm on a 12 story cruise ship that towers over everything back at home in the cruise port. But you get out there and you're you're slowly going through um, ice carved trenches and you're you're the, the the mountainous region is towering over you and it's just like it makes you feel small and i like it was that anomaly in interstellar plausible at all i don't know um it, it, we were told that in interstellar that a lot of that was plausible so i guess i wouldn't argue the science too much but but i do remember the of the anomaly of like our main character is in is literally within time space, like that fourth, fourth, fifth dimensionality, and causes a gravitic anomaly to send a message back. So yeah, anywhere. Yeah, Interstellar, that love, that love lets Interstellar love lets trans space and time is a no. Really? Oh, otherwise it depends on how many actual dimensions there are and if our perception of time is even close to reality. Oh, you're you're a funny dud. I'm gonna fold my arms and pout there, Drew. Mm. <laughs> because yes, I get it. It's a little maybe it's a little touchy feely and that love is the is the great energy that pushes. I I think maybe you know it could have it could have had a different descriptor for it. Like um, the idea that we can push ourselves to a point at which um, I look at it like love isn't the only thing. It's hope and courage and uh, faith. And the a, a, that is not about us, but about the continuance of humanity that really push people and stuff. Oh, Drew, yeah. Uh, so, oh, by the way, shit, is, the, is my book here? Uh, no, I left it downstairs. Sorry. Um, I've been reading. I'm, I'm about forty percent of my way through the uh, Heroin's Labyrinth. We, we, listen, we get we're at the end of the show. This is where we we segue. We do a hard squirrely turn, you know, with a squirrel. What distracted? So, anyway. Thank you very much for letting me talk about faster than light travel for your tabletop role playing games. But um, uh, Drew and I are on or are simpatico we about a current book, and um, the release of that book is the Heroine's Labyrinth, and it gives us another storytelling uh, idea. <laughs> also in the Joy Division. Yeah. Oh, oh, it just popped. All your your things just popped up. But I was told that love will tear us apart. Yeah, all the love songs. Yeah, love was enabled him to create that anomaly where he sent a message to himself in the past. Um, I, you get the idea that that's how he was able to navigate through the complexity of the fourth dimensional space that he was in, is what I'm gathering. Relationships. <laughs> And family courts are what tear us apart. Oof, ooh, but don't boom. Wow. <laughs> I, I should make a t-shirt relationships. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much um, for being a part of the show. Uh, if you if you want to be a writer or you want to tell more stories about your heroes returning back home and navigating the complexities of home uh between the journey and the labyrinth, the the travel outwards adventure and the internal adventuring of of uh, navigating through the social structures or government or um, intricacies thereof. I really suggest that you you look up the heroine's labyrinth. Yes, I did some videos on it as well, but um, I think it's very very. Uh, it is the flip side of the coin. It is the yin and yang of storytelling, and I I truly do believe that it will be. Uh, it, it's kind of history making. I hope people find, I hope script writers and novelists and other people find the book and um, give Doug credit for what he has uh, discovered. Uh, and by his own admission, he's like, I didn't create it. He's like, I found these archetypal, uh, archetypal relationships, monomyths for the, the, the heroine as for the hero, even though it is not genderfied. Um, 
but he did say that he wanted to tell a like is there a monomyth for the 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 woman in history the the young girl or the moms and things and yes i i think it's true but i also think these are like detective noir um uh, soldier hunter returning home and finding that home is different and i like that this is i hate that he calls that also a monomyth really why uh i mean i think it would be cool to collect the i think that the i the the, the the idea of calling it a monomyth is that it is a it is a uh, monolithic. I don't think he means like one. I think it's monolithic that you can apply. Many cultures tell the same stories over and over again. And I would love to see other cultures have their mytho mythological archetypal stories also codified, which would be kind of cool. Yeah, Drew says mono means one alone. It would be a meta myth. Yeah, I, I think I think the I don't think it's one. I think they mean monolithic, at least at least that's what my brain is telling me. Um, I never thought of it as as one as the only one, because then that would mean there's two ones. That doesn't make any sense. Right. Although. Technically, mono does mean one, <laughs> right? Like a monolith, I think, is considered called a monolith because it's just like one big giant like monolithic thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely the same issue if you are all, all encompassing, then you then you use meta. Yeah. Or poly or something like that. Like something that's yeah. Um but I think what I think the the what they're also the literary world, which I'm not part of, um is uh trying to say that that all of these stories coalesce into one story meaning like like uh, a hero's journey is the journey of heroes from it doesn't matter what culture you're from or what age it is the leaving of home and confronting the dragon and and then coming back home after you know and meeting the mentor and things like that that even in our own lives yeah, anon's like <laughs> a little song about it uh i, I I'm, I'm trying to figure out what song that is that he's got in the head because i it's hard to hard to like <laughs> read it and see what song it is, but I'm imagining it is. But anyway, yeah, yeah, I I think it's the idea that like, hey, you know, like when we when we watch movies and television, and sometimes we roll our eyes because we're like, oh, we've I've seen the story told in pl plenty of times, right? Um, uh, it's it's how TV tropes, the the website uh TV tropes exist, right? There's a lot of tropes in it. Yeah, Drew says, yeah, no, I strongly disagree with Campbell. Yeah. Okay. But again, Drew, maybe maybe you might discover other um, meta myths that exist out there in other cultures. That would be kind of cool for somebody to discover that. I think that's what Doug did. I mean, I, I think if Doug could find that what he found, then there's no reason that we won't find other archetypical storytelling that is told to educate us or uh, things of that nature. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There might be a there might be like a third leg <laughs> uh, in 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 the yin and yang of the uh, of the labyrinth and the 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 journey. So yeah, there maybe there's something in the middle. Um, maybe a story, something about travel like not even arriving where you're going but traveling to a new place or traveling to a place and settling down and and starting a new life maybe there's some kind of um mythic mythologic storytelling about people who travel from an old place and get to a new place or meeting new people when traveling and establishing new roots or something maybe there's something like that yeah, and 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 on says the same thing. Yeah, meta myth is a, is a far better term for this sort of thing, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I I, I can't I I won't disagree with you on that. Uh, I just think it's we, we are it. There's a comfort and identity in using the same terminology so that other people understand what you're talking about. Um, heck, even Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about the fact that we shouldn't really be uh uh, uh using the words we have incorrect terminology for the things that exist out in space um 
like the difference between moon and planet and asteroid and things like that. And, you know, maybe we're just using terminology that's old and outdated and we need to like update it, which I, I have no problem with that. But listen, even today, calling people by like different pronouns gets pe under people's skin because, I mean, how do we expect people to learn something new? You know, <laughs> uh, you, you expect me to, 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 you know, um, openly and, and casually and honestly ask you a question about who you want to be called. That's, that's too much brain power. Sorry. <laughs> Ursula, Le, uh, uh, Ursula Le, Le Quinn had that a carrier bag. I don't, I don't know what the, what one has to do with the other, but I like Ursula, um, K Le Guin, uh, writing. Oh man. Um, boo, 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 boo. let's see if I can find a bunch of her books. Of course she comes up. Um, and let's see if we get a, a huge list. Wikipedia, of course, that's one of my go-tos. And education, bibliography, here we go. Fantasy art list of science, I don't want a whole list of science fiction authors, I want a list of her books. Mm-mm-mm. There we go. Wider exploration. Damn, there's a whole lot. Ooh. I'm not I'm not even gonna start because I won't even be able to finish it all. Oof. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. She's up there with um with uh Vonnegut and such. Anon says, as a linguist, I also agree with this, with this takes. It's always a balance between the colloquial and the technical. Yeah, and 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 um and uh sociologically we also identify with something that already exists as well and just becomes common parlance so like if you if you notice in um and i do i overdo this in uh writing with obsidian star i use a lot of like um um palindromes and what's this something uh, uh words that sound similar a lot of slang like mutated slang in my own head i use a lot of that uh like the, the zipper jacket thing or the the, the idea of like force flex and fulcrum for um, for using rolling the dice and that kind of thing I, I do a lot of that maybe a little bit too much to like take people out of it but but yeah <laughs> so so I think there's also a social part of this where where the the word doesn't fit but we use it anyway and then that word takes on its own meaning and then people no longer use the word for what it used to mean. We start using it for what it now means because we made a new meaning for it, which happens so often, much like, um, like the word woke has been co-opted. And, uh, and, and now you can't even say woke without it meaning uh, its current definition rather than what it actually means, which is like, yeah, I'm not asleep any long, longer. So yeah. Thing is just an e essay she wrote, not a whole book, but I really liked it. Okay, cool. And the bureaucratic language that nobody uses except on official government documents, nobody reads anyway. Yep, yep, yep. The 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 legalese, uh, medicine is another thing. Uses lots of Latin. Uh, legal documents use lots of Latin as well. And um, and language we have. Heck, I work under a contract that's got like fuzzy language in it, which you should never put fuzzy language in a contract. And yet I still get paid and I have a great lifestyle because of it. And we have, we, there's words in our contract that are like maybe, sometimes, usually. And we're just like, why would you put that? But that's what happens when you go to arbitration and you have an arbitrator rewrite the language of a, of a contract to appease both sides. And yeah, we have a, we actually have a working bureaucratic contract that has words in it like, um, you, you know, um, or the usual schedule or or most of the time your supervisor will or when sometimes asked and it's like well sometimes what 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 happens without the other times right so yeah so anyway guys thank you very much for being part of the show i really appreciate it um also thank you very much for for just uh, just uh um having these conversations and such i love science fiction i love the the um the the 
the dissemination of thinking about the what if of the future. Uh, for me, science fiction is my fantasy world. And um, and I, listen, I have no, I'm an armchair individual. I love the concepts and um, I'm always a learner. Juice says, thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you for allowing me to host such a thing. And um, there's something I wanted to let you guys know about. And I, my brain just farted and it just woof, poof, right out of my head, <laughs> which happens when you get older. Um, uh, uh, also, slight, slight personal thing. You've no, if you've noticed, I don't wear glasses any longer. And that's because uh, I've changed my diet. I've started to lose weight. I have issues. It runs in the family. Diabetes, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol. Uh, th these are usual things genetically within my family and in a larger extent through the history of uh, African-Americans here. So um, I will be wearing glasses once they arrive, but my, eye my eyesight has changed because of my sugar, which changes the, the uh, shape of the lens and the fluid in the eye, which which is why people who are diabetic have um, um, circulatory issues and nerve issues and eye issues. So, but my eyesight has actually gotten better. So I'm not wearing contacts or anything. I'm actually just not wearing glasses any longer. Weird. If your employment contract does not spell out ambiguous conditions, also how many pages is your contract? Uh, hundreds. Uh, let's see. Um, how long is the NALC? contract with the uh, postal service. Um, let's see, will I, do I have a number here? Nope, I don't have a number, but I do have the contract. N yeah, it's about to expire July 19th. Nah, it's, it's not given uh, on a cursory cursory glance. I, I mean, I, I have a digital version of our contract. It's pretty big, but I'd have to call it up. And then uh, do I have a PDF of it? I don't have I don't have a PDF of it. We have a website to get to it. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's pretty strange to even like, why would someone eat? It doesn't matter. It even we even we are just like, why is this even in the contract? And then that contract that argument then goes into union negotiations or um, may, sometimes it even breaks down to the local level where we have an argument with our bosses, whether we are instructed to do a thing or not do a thing and things like that. So, And, and then the fuzzy language has to be argued over and such. So that's why we have a union because those fuzzy parts of our contract get abused and people get abused. And while people hate there are those who hate unions because they protect some of the worst employees. Those of us that aren't the worst employees also need protection too against employers who want to take advantage of people. So yeah, so it's just curious. All the contracts I've ever worked on are totally straightforward and easy to understand, but it's private sector business. Yeah. Sounds like your government contract is meant to confuse people. Uh, I don't even think it's just even meant to. I, I think part of it is, is, um, ignorance because government isn't business right because business knows what they're doing right because they because on both ends both sides of business is like we need to clear this shit out right you know real business can can get down to things as simple as like you know um hours and minutes of a of a thing um the, the spe specificity of how many number of employees and the days it like there's so, they can get you can get make a contract um that is is so hyper specific that it it can even count nuts and bolts in a thing and who's responsible for it for um you know within inches of if you cross this line then you're responsible for this other side and we we're on this side and it's 38.6 meters to this point blah blah blah, blah. like you can do that in the contract um you could put anything in a contract if you spell it out. This is government, so <laughs> government's not really good at business at all. You guys know that. So, but anyway, Drew, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for being part of the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for just um for being here. Got to get out of this place. Don't know when I'll ever get back, except tomorrow at six a.m. Eastern Standard Time when we get to talk about 
Oh, uh, what's a good one? Andromeda, maybe? I don't know. Maybe Andromeda. <laughs> yeah. That you make a good point. Yeah. If you need an army of lawyers to interpret your job contract, it's a sign that the system is meant to provide work for lawyers that wouldn't have anything to do if the contracts were easy to read. Uh burn. <laughs> Cause that's too true. Um, much like our um our IRS tax system has a bunch of people running around that really if if it wasn't as complicated as it was, we wouldn't really need them. And honestly, we really don't even need them because all that that uh, tax information has already been submitted to the government, except for people who are trying to not submit that information, right? Which means that you really only need people going after those who aren't being forthcoming with their taxes. Not everybody, but that exists too. Guys, have a great one. I'll see you later. Peace and tranquility. I'm out. Mm -mm 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 -mm.